Action-packed week, and uh, now we're going to kick it off. Uh, I'm going to just talk to you for the next 40 minutes or so about a whole bunch of things. Really keep kind of the number 10 in your mind. I'm going to start talking about four facts, four things that are true about the consumer in the world today. Then I'm going to segue into six results of that, six trends. And so what are some of these emerging trends and, and the impact of technology? Again, six of them. First and foremost, the impact of online sales. Online is, I mean, it just simply wasn't around 15 years ago. Simply wasn't around. And this chart is very, very interesting. It shows the percentage out of 100 percent of online retailing and where it's being done in the world. And by the way, this entire deck is, you'll be able to download it. Uh, and You'll have this all full slide to go back and study a lot of these. But basically, in 2013, Asia Pacific was 33.4 percent of all the internet e-commerce in the world. Pretty good sized share of the pie. While North America, by the way, in 2013, had dropped to really the number two position at 31.5 of the 100% of e-commerce. You look out here to 2016, Asia Pacific is growing to almost 40%, while North America is, is shrinking to 28.2. Not that e-commerce isn't going up, but as a percentage, it's declining. Why? Because Asia Pacific is growing so large and fast. So the opportunity for e-commerce is right in your backyard, <laughs> literally in your backyard. And so absolutely huge opportunities there. And again, brick and mortar shopping is already migrating to online experiences. We know this with, for example, probably what you wouldn't want to own today is a record store. <laughs> Or you would want to own a CD store or a DVD store. We know that, a, or a bookstore for that matter. We know a lot of that has moved to online. So Redbox is the is the uh, uh, brick and mortar version of Netflix, and Redbox is is a place where you can go. Uh, it's a vending machine for DVDs, and basically that business is a declining business. The post office. I'm sorry, we've got you in the room here. That's moving over to Stamps.com. Uh, bank and deposit and teller ATM. I can't tell you the last time I saw a teller. How about you guys? When was the last time you act, interacted with a teller in a bank? I mean, come on. I mean, did I do all that on my phone? <laughs> I don't need I can even scan checks now. I don't even need to go to the bank to deposit money. So all of that is moving online. Shoe stores, yeah, we've got Zappos, and, and there's a whole bunch of other really great stores out there. So a lot of brick and mortar is migrating to online. And the other crazy thing or difficult thing for us is, is it used to be the customers just read newspapers, got in their car, or got on the subway and went to a store. Today, their purchase journey begins in a whole bunch of different places. Sometimes their purchase journey begins on a tablet. Sometimes it begins on a computer. Sometimes it begins on a smartphone. And it sometimes ends up in a store, sometimes ends up somewhere else. The consumer or the buying path today is a very, very convoluted one. And how mobile phones are used, 75% of customers use them to find store locations in hours. Again, if I'm doing mobile phone development, what do you think I need to have on the front page of my mobile uh, uh, web browser, uh, web page for the consumer? Well, clearly, locations and hours. Uh, how about where, uh, while in store, look up and compare prices? Again, this we'll talk about in a second, this whole concept of showrooming, that, that verb that is being thrown around today. Yes, consumers are using their phones in stores, and you do it, <laughs> and you've seen it done to check prices. But by the way, they're also doing it to, to look sometimes for reviews. They're looking at what is this product, you know, what do other people say about this product? So it's not just pricing. Also search for coupons, and much less so, smaller, almost 33%, 34% to uh, actually make a purchase. We're seeing more and more 
enabling, and you'll see some of this at Mot Motorola, although we, we really schedule Motorola for much more of the back end side, but Motorola's got an incredible number of devices for the front end side. But we're seeing more and more retailers using and enabling and giving their sales associates devices to be able to use with the customer. And what's interesting, again, we're still in the early stages of this. Last year, we had the, the group from Spring Singapore we talked about. We took them to New York for two days. And in one of the experiences we brought them to was a company called Sea Wonder. And C. Wonder is Tory Burch's ex-husband, anyway, who started this retail uh, chain. And the big deal in C. Wonder was that they were using mobile POS devices, okay, handheld devices to check out the customer. And that was phenomenal. It was amazing. If you go into that same C. Wonder store today, they're all gone. Why are they all gone? They didn't work. <laughs> they didn't work. It was a little too early, a little too early. They couldn't get the network to run fast enough. The sales associates were really struggling with checking out customers. Sometimes, just to have technology for technology's sake, it, you know, but, but Chris Birch and, and C. Wonder was smart enough to recognize when it began to frustrate customers and associates, pull it out. A year from now, will it be back in C. Wonder? Absolutely, <laughs> you know, absolutely. But people do make mistakes. And so a lot of times you'll see something really cool and, and you're, you're, you, know, you should go, oh, that really is cool. But then you should ask, okay, is it sustainable? <laughs> will it really work? And Motorola will show you, for example, that their products are what are called retail hardened. You can drop them, spill Coke on them, throw them against the wall, and they will still work. They will work for a 14-hour day. You ever try using an iPad as a POS device? I got news for you. It's going to run out of battery in about four or five hours using it as a POS device. So what are you going to do? Have your sales associates plugged in all the time? I don't think so. You'll probably get a, a, a cradle for it and put it in the cradle to give it some more battery power. But then if you drop it, the screen might drop. So we've got a lot of stuff to, to fix there. And again, this whole use of converged platforms, the reason for it is to get, and this is the holy grail for retailers, the single view of a customer. The single view of a customer. And, and you know, it's like our, 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 <laughs> our quest for the, uh, you know, the single truth. It really almost is impossible to achieve it, but we are really trying today. And so we're moving from this multi-channel to this omni-channel concept. And if you think about it, in omni-channel, if I'm going to engage with you as a customer, so any of your businesses, think about it now, how customers contact you today. Some of them call you on the phone. Some of them walk into your brick and mortar presence, if, if you have it. Some of you engage, uh, some of your customers will connect via a website, your website. Uh, some will engage or connect via your mobile tablet site. <laughs> Some of them will engage via a smartphone. All of those different ways. Are you recognizing them as being the same customer? No retailer today can do it, by the way. No retailer today can do it. So I can engage with Ralph Lauren on a tablet. I could search the Ralph Lauren store. I could even make a purchase in the Ralph Lauren store, close up my tablet, and walk into a Ralph Lauren store, and they won't know me from Adam. They have no idea who I am. Even when they take my credit card at point of sale, they cannot connect me to that transaction that occurred via an electronic method an hour, a day, a week ago. Now, there's some reasons for that technologically. There's also some legal reasons. <laughs> Therein lies another problem. Find it in the store. Your website may say that you carry this product, but is it available right at that moment in that particular location that I'm going to go shop in? Because if you're really going to be an omni-channel retailer, You've got to be able to say to the customer, yes, we have it. Yes, we have the one you want. 
And here's where it's at in the store. We'll talk about that in a minute. It's another concept called geofencing. We will be able to exactly pinpoint it for you on a list, and we'll put it on your phone so that when you're in the store, you can just follow your phone around, and it'll bring you to each individual item. The only way you're ever going to do that is through a NFC technology, near field communication, or an RFID. It's the only way you're going to be able to do that. And by the way, it will never, ever be perfect unless you pre-allocate an item. Because think about it. You just told a customer that, that this item is available. It's sitting there waiting on the shelf for that customer. And that customer is out in the parking lot. I come in. Oh, I want this item. I take it. <laughs> and I go pay for it. Well, that customer coming in, that item was supposed to be there. Now, you can pre-allocate. You can tell the sales associate to go grab that item and put it behind the counter. But then you take it off of potential sale. Or you can have two or three or four or five as a backup. And again, oh gosh, there's so much of this here. Free shipping a product brought from, bought from the website but picked up at the store. Again, customers love the word free. <laughs> Don't ever forget that. Free is wonderful. And so when we can, you know, again, the omni-channel consumer loves that. If they can get free shipping and all they have to do is go pick it up in the store, that's fine with them. And so the challenge is to be able to consolidate all of this information that you're getting about the customer. I don't know if any of you, there's a few of you in the room who have been in web development, uh, and, and Jerry could certainly speak to it, uh, being the geek that he is, what web logs look like. <laughs> when you're trying to sift through and look at how my customer or customers shop the site. What was my conversion rate? How long did they spend on this page, on this page, on this item? You're getting a huge amount of data. And by the way, that's all in the aggregate. That's in the total. How do you do that by individual? How do I know that Jim Dion, the person standing here in front of me in the store, was also on the web last night and he looked at this, and this, and this, and this. And by the way, he spent five minutes on this one. This is probably the one he's really interested in. How do you do that? Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> one of the ways you've got to do it is, is no matter what, is be very careful of this. Because the privacy laws around the data that you keep about customers the observational data, in other words, when you're observing them in your store, and there's technologies around that. Again, last year we had, because we were more brick and mortar oriented, we had a presentation from Retail Next. And these are the guys who study consumers in a store using cameras in the ceiling. And they know exactly where sales associates and where consumers are going. Uh, and we, they can actually track consumers via their Wi-Fi signal or sometimes via the uh, 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 cell, the electronic serial number of the cell phone. They're very, very cognizant and aware of the privacy of the customer. And as more and more consumers are joining the witness protection program, uh, I don't know if you have that in Singapore, you probably don't, you don't have that many criminals. By the way, in the U.S. we have this program called the witness protection program where if you, you know, the government will put you under deep cover uh, uh, to protect you. A lot of regular American consumers today are very concerned about the data shadow that they're casting. Most American consumers don't even know what a cookie is. They think it's something they buy in a store. <laughs> and, and they don't really realize that they're being tracked. They're being, oh, most consumers don't. I, we can go out in the street and interview 100 civilians tonight on Michigan Avenue and ask them if they know what an internet cookie is. And trust me, 99 out of 100 will go, huh? Can I eat it? Can I chew it? Is it a chocolate chip? No idea. That's number five, the use of big data. <laughs> We've all heard, this is another great buzzword in retail today, big data. And, you know, what, what's amazing is, is the larger we build storage, the more junk we put into it, okay? It's the same in the closets in your home or your garage or any other storage area you have in your life. It's the same with your hard drive or your electronic cloud drive, I don't care. The bigger we build it, the more we fill it up. 10 years ago, a terabyte of data was an awesome amount of data. 
you know, within a year we'll have a terabyte on our phone. I mean, it is no big deal anymore. So as we built all of this, we've also now kept all kinds of data. We've kept all kinds of data. Used to be in retail, for example, that at the end of the year, we would basically wipe 98, 99% of our transactional data and only keep uh, totals. Walmart started 15 years ago keeping every transaction. And even to this day, I can log into Walmart 3.0, go into that, go into that engine, and I can say, Ajax dish detergent, eight ounce size, how many did we sell between 10 in the morning and 11 in the morning in Greenwich, Connecticut on November 2nd, 2005? And it'll return a number within 10 seconds. It keeps that level of data down to that skew time hour transaction data. Retailers are keeping huge amounts of data today. Again, credit card swipes, because of laws we have in the US, we can't hold those numbers anymore, but we can hold information about the customer, their name, and we can then match that information with information that the credit card companies hold. So the credit card company knows your address, it knows your income, it knows your preferences, and it sells that data back to the retailers. And the retailers sell that data back to the credit card companies. So big data is alive and well out there. And more and more of it is growing. You would be shocked, shocked, by the amount of data that Google has about you. RFID, again, is going to lead the way. It's going to be embedded in everything. And RFID is going to lead to the Internet of Things. It is going to make us connected. And we're also seeing the whole concept of geofencing. That today, by using femtocells and other technologies, uh, some proprietary, some public like femtocell, I can tell whether, when you're within two kilometers of my store. I can identify where you parked, how long it took you to get from the car park or the subway station to my store. I can identify where you walked in my store, how long you looked at the window, which sales associate you engaged in with. I can look at all of that. And then if I build a geofence, I could say as soon as you cross in, I'm going to text you a coupon to entice you to come and shop in my store. And so it's turning into the store of the future. And again, this store is going to be a very, very different place for everybody in this room. It's your, it's your web. It's your brick and mortar location. It's your warehouse. It's every, every part of your business is going to be a part of this store of the future. So we might have, for example, dri drive through pickup locations. And we're going to see, I believe, more of these. As the consumer, again, wants convenience. It's going to be very targeted, very time efficient, and it's going to be about needs-based trips. I need to pick this up, this up, and this up. I just put in, or I just talk to my phone device and say, what I, oh, I've got to pick up some diapers. I've got to pick up some formula. I've got to pick this up, pick up, whatever. And as soon as you swing by that particular place, they're loading it into the trunk of your car, and away you go. Again, very, very convenient. Product showrooms. We're going to see stores that actually become showrooms. They're going to say, look, we're not even going to fight this. You're not even going to be able to buy here. We have a company, a couple of companies like this in the US already. Design Within Reach is one of them. You go in, you look at beautifully designed products. You can't buy one in the store if you wanted to. You've got to order it there, and then they will ship it from somewhere else. We helped Dell a couple of years ago, Dell Computer Company, when they set up some of their first retail stores, which were, again, simply showrooms. Let people look at what the product looked like, order it online, and ship it right from there. And immersive experiential centers. And again, where the customer experiences your brand. You'll be able to see one, and we've got one on your shopping list called the AT&T store. Stores with a point of difference that is not about price.